So I'm not re-preaching the sermon that I preached eight months ago, but I'm just touching on this topic again, just because we had the baptisms yesterday, um, and I just want everybody on the same page, or at least everybody knowing why I do what I do. So the title of my sermon today is Defending Jesus-Only Baptism. Defending Jesus-Only Baptism. Now, what do I mean by Jesus-Only Baptism? It means that when somebody gets baptized, it ought to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That that's what we should be pronouncing when we baptize them, as opposed to what some people do is they baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'll go through, uh, it's not going to be, I'm not re-preaching, like I said, this sermon from eight months ago. I've got some new things in there. And also, I'm I'm addressing more so in this sermon uh, some of the objections that some of you guys have raised. So I know, uh, obviously, I've talked about it with you guys as well. Um, And just addressing those. So at least everybody's aware of the objections um, and and how to overcome those objections and, and what the answer to it is. Now, so that's the title of my sermon, Defending Jesus Only Baptism. Now, the first thing I want to say, I just want to make a couple of points about this topic. The first thing is, you can believe in the Trinity and baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can even believe in the Orthodox or Catholic Trinity, right? Which I don't accept, right? I don't accept the Catholic or the Orthodox Trinity and baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I do believe in the Trinity. I believe that there are three persons that are one person. That's the position of the Trinity that I believe. I reject uh, three persons, one essence. I don't believe God is just a group of three gods. I believe he's also one person at the same time as three persons. But I also reject that that God is not just one person in three natures. I think those natures have identities. They can be classified as persons. So that is my position on the Trinity. But see, whether you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or whether you baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus has nothing to do uh, with your position on the Trinity in the sense that you can believe in the Trinity, you can even believe in the Catholic Trinity and baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, granted, people that believe in modalism, they do baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I'm saying is that these are not intrinsically linked. These are, exclu- these, these, are, uh, these are mutually exclusive. Whilst one sometimes comes with the other, you can baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ even though you believe in the Trinity and even though you believe in the, the Catholic Trinity. Um, so, now I know there are people out there you know, obviously people like Stephen Anderson, right, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, people like that, obviously they don't think that this is possible. They think, well, if you baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that automatic, automatically makes you a modalist. This is not true, because you can argue for baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ whilst rejecting modalism, whilst rejecting even, you know, one person, three natures. You can, you can still baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus, even though you accept the Trinity as I believe it, and even if you accept the Trinity, as the Orthodox or the Catholics accept it. Now, you know what's interesting, though? I wanted to show you a couple of uh, slides here because, and I didn't know about this before this all went down, but uh, somebody, somebody uh, uh, shared a video on YouTube where there was actually a declaration of faith, like a confession of faith, you know, where people, they, they write a confession of faith and people sign to it that they agree to it. There was a confession of faith that was done by Baptists in 1660, right? Saying that you could either baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. This, this is groundbreaking to me. I was, so anyways, I just wanted to show you a couple of screenshots from this Confession of Faith. And if you want, I'll put the link on Facebook later and put the link in, in WhatsApp so you guys can go and look at the book yourself. But basically it was a book that compiled a bunch of Baptist Confession of Faith over the years so that they could see what Baptists believe and things like that. So look at this. This is, a, this, is this uh, brief confession of a declaration of faith. This is the, some, uh, some Baptists in London, right, in 1660. Look what they say here. Set out by many of us who are falsely called Anabaptists. Right? Why, why Anabaptists? They were labeled as Anabaptists because they were rebaptizing people that were sprinkled. You know, kind of like what we did to Neil, right? We rebaptized him because <laughs> he was only sprinkled as a baby. We got him actually baptized. So that's why they were called Anabaptists. They're saying falsely called Anabaptists because they're not actually rebaptizing people. They're baptizing them for the first time. To inform form all men in these days of scandal and rep- in these days of scandal and reproach of our innocent belief and practice. 
right? For which we are not only resolved to suffer persecution, to the loss of our goods, but also life itself, rather than to decline the same. And these old London people, right? When they, when they phrase things, it's always like so, so dramatic. So, but what they're writing in this confession of faith, they're saying, hey, they're willing to suffer persecution for it. They're willing to even lose their life for it in this time of scandal and reproach. Look what it says here. This is, uh, this is on page 113 of this book, but it says here, that the right and only way of gathering churches according to Christ's appointment, Matthew, uh, was it 28, 19, 20, is first to teach or preach the gospel, Mark 16, to the sons and daughters of men, and then to baptize, that is in English, to dip, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or, look at this, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Such only of them as profess repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at this, they even quote Acts 2.38 as a basis for why somebody can baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is not just a oneness Pentecostal view. This is also a Baptist view from the 1660s. Granted, it might be a minority Baptist view, but it's not just only to the oneness Pentecostals. There were Baptists back here in 1660 that said, hey, we accept that the Bible teaches both and there are differing views and they're just saying here well either one in this instance they're saying is okay whether you say father son and they put holy spirit right and holy ghost um or in the name of the lord jesus christ now this confession of faith if you read it in here it was actually signed if you, if you count the number of names there's about 40 names here it's subscribed by certain elders deacons and brethren met at london in the first month called March 1660, in the behalf of themselves and many others unto whom they belong in London and in several countries of this nation, who are of the same faith with us. So then it gives a list of all the names of the, of the bishops and deacons. But look at the footnote at the bottom. It says, among the above names, Crosby inserts the name of Thomas Gratham and also adds the following sentence, owned and approved by more than 20,000. So I don't, we don't really know who's a bishop here, who's a deacon here, who's maybe just a, a brother, a brethren in the church. But I'd say if it's signed, these are probably notable people in the church. Now, there are over 40 names here. Now, there are not even 40 bishops and deacons in the new IFB, right? But I'm sure if somebody said, hey, all, all the people in the new IFB believe this, they'd say, oh, look at all these preachers that believe this. But you have a group of 40 people here that said, hey, you could baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Ghost. You could baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they signed to it saying, hey, we're willing to suffer persecution for this. We're willing to, to die for this confession of faith. They put their names to that. So I just think it's interesting that even in history, we see that there are Baptists that recognize this. And it's funny because I was talking to Kevin, and Ke Kevin knew this. I, I never knew this. Because honestly, I never really looked into this topic in the sense that, you know, I, I just did what was passed down to me, not really thinking about it. Kind of like people are pre-trib. Right, they're pre-trib because it's just passed down to them, right? But then when they actually start looking into it, they're like, hey, wait, this is not pre-trib. And then what does somebody say to them? Well, nobody believes the post-trib, uh, you know, post pre-rapture. You're in the minority view, but what do we say to that? Well, it doesn't matter if it's the minority view because if that's what the Bible teaches, that's what we believe. And how many times when you talk to people about the rapture and things like that, they're like, oh, nobody believes it. That's not a Baptist view and everything like that. And it's like, you know, what does it matter? You know, I'm not even saying this because... You know, is this why we base it? No, I'm just saying, you know, if, if, you really, if somebody really wants to say no Baptist has ever believed it, I just don't think they can because um, th this, this exists from 1660. But I don't, not only that, so that's, that's, the, that's the book it came from, but not only that, I mean, in the Bible, the Holy Ghost himself describes the baptisms done in Acts, um, you know, in the name of the Lord Jesus. So obviously he's not denying the exist of a, ex existence of himself, describing it that way, right? Because if somebody says, well, if you baptize only in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're denying the Trinity, I mean, is the Holy Ghost denying himself when he, when, when he describes the baptisms that they were doing in Acts as um, baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? So I affirm the Trinity, right? I affirm that God is three persons in one person. Um, you know, obviously, I like I said, I reject the Orthodox Trinity. I reject just three natures in one person. So that's my first point. My first point is you can believe the Trinity, um, and still practice baptism by pronouncing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as opposed to in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, my second point is, now, does this validate or invalidate a baptism? See, my answer is no, because it, it, doesn't, like, it doesn't really matter in the sense of it doesn't validate or invalidate your baptism what the person who's baptizing you says. 
right? Now, some people might believe that it does. And if somebody, if somebody believes that what the person says, right, it validates your baptism or not, I would liken that to somebody saying, well, you've made an oath with your spouse, right? You're now married, but the guy that performed your wedding didn't say, I now pronounce you husband and wife. And that's like saying you're not married just because he didn't say those words. So whether the words are said or not doesn't validate or invalidate a baptism, right? Because a baptism could be valid if nothing is said, right? If somebody's baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, or, and I think it's equivalent to the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you know, even if nobody said anything, they would still be uh, uh, um, legitimately baptized. Now, you've got to think about this, right? If somebody takes the position, well, you must say specific words in order to make a baptism valid, then you just have to ask the questions like this. Well, what did John the Baptist say when he baptized people? I mean, were people who were baptized by John the Baptist not uh, you know, legitimately baptized? We don't even know what John the Baptist said, right? But we do know who John the Baptist was pointing them to, when he baptized, right? And we'll get to those verses in a second. So we don't know what John the Baptist, you know, really said. Did he say anything? You know, I mean, he was baptizing hundreds and hundreds of people. I mean, did he say the same thing every time they were getting baptized? Or did they just know when they came, they were being baptized, you know, through the baptism that was given by God? Uh, so what did John the Baptist say? I mean, do we even really know what the disciples said when they baptized? We don't really know what they said. We know what's described but we don't know exactly what they said when they actually baptized somebody in the water. Now, obviously, if somebody baptizes in the name of a false god or they baptize in the name of, you know, Muhammad or you know, some other, you know, and I don't know any other religion that has baptisms, uh, maybe they do, but obviously that would be invalid, right? But what, what we're talking about here is, is in the name of Jesus Christ equivalent to uh, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So if somebody does you know, believe that it invalidates a baptism, then obviously this sermon is even more important to them because it matters even more to that person. Um, but what we are talking about today, what I think the two positions really and what everybody uh, should be debating over is what pronouncement of baptism is more scriptural? Because if baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, like we saw from this confession of faith, and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost is equivalent, then what practice is better what practice do we actually see in the bible what should we actually be following and i think the position that we ought to say the name of the lord jesus christ when we do anything including baptism i think the scriptural support is overwhelming and this is what i'm going to go through in this sermon and you know what's so uh, i guess ironic about this whole situation, about the controversy over, you know, whether to baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or whether to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, is that the name of Jesus, is, is, it's like it's never been so controversial before. I mean, everything we do is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I find ironic about it is because, you know, if we're Baptists, right, and baptism is what we're all about and we do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, but it's ironic that baptism is the only thing if it's done in the name of the Lord Jesus it's like, you know, cast out. It's like, well, anything to do with that, even though, you know, baptism is really what, where we get the name Baptist from. I just find it a bit ironic that amongst Baptists that the name of Jesus has never been so controversial and it's in the topic of baptism. So let's go on uh, to, to, to look at a couple of these passages. So the first thing I want to talk about is all the things that are done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, and if you haven't listened to my last sermon, it's pretty overwhelming in terms of what we do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because everything is done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed. Now, word or deed, that encompasses everything, right? I mean, I'm either saying something or I'm doing something. And the Bible's saying here, if you, if, whether you say something, whether you do something, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now, does all mean all, right? Or does, is, this, is this saying, well, all, everything, except baptism, right? And obviously, I'm going to get to Matthew 28 in this sermon. So we see here that we're commanded everything should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's, it's surprising to me that, you know, that it would be controversial to do something in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ when all through the Bible, everything's done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, we're saved by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 
Look, we gather in the name of Jesus Christ. See, when we gather here as a church, whose name are we gathering in, right? We're gathering in the name of the Lord Jesus. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. John 14, why do we always end prayer with, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. It's because it comes from the Bible, right? Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So if you're wondering why when Christians pray and they finish their prayer and they say, we pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen, we get this from the Bible. It's not just a tradition that's just passed down. They're following this practice, this teaching. Ephesians 5.20 says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even when we praise God, we give thanks to God. The Bible says we should do that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. James 5, 14, when you pray over somebody when they're sick, you anoint them with oil. It says here, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now I showed you this, I didn't show you this one last time, but Matthew 7, I thought it was interesting when you look at the false prophets even, or, not, or just the, even the false converts even. I don't know if there's so much false prophets, they might be as well. But even just the false converts, people that were uh, believing, they were doing things for Jesus, but they were trusting their own works. Look at what it says here. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So obviously these people in here were trusting those good works. But what I wanted to point out here is, isn't it interesting that even these people, that's where the emphasis is in the Christian work, right? The emphasis in the Christian work is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we stand for. That's why we do everything. That's the authority and the name by which we gather. Um, everything is done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, even prayer this is just a few examples but what are we talking about we're talking about the controversial one right the one that seems to can't be can't be associated with the name of the lord jesus christ um and i'll get into those reasons but the next one is you know baptism is included i believe in doing things in the name of the lord jesus christ and we'll look at a couple of passages here first we'll look at first corinthians um uh, 1 Corinthians 1, where I believe Paul is alluding to this practice of baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. Look here in 1 Corinthians 1. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I of Christ. So what's happening in the 1 Corinthians church is people are, people are starting to get a cult mentality, right? In the sense that, oh, I'm of this person, I'm of that person, starting to associate with people rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that online. People, they're even referring to them, like I would never want to be referred to by somebody else's name other than Jesus Christ. But people will be calling people like Rachmanites, you got Andersonites, you got Heil, this. They all want to be associated with a person or whatnot. Um, but this ought not be the case, right? And what is Paul saying here? Is Christ divided, right? Because we should all be associating ourselves with Jesus Christ because that's the name, like I said, we identify. That's why we're called Christians. That's why we gather. That's why we pray. It says here, is Christ divided? But look at this. Was Paul crucified for you? Right? No, right? So because Paul is saying, no, Christ was crucified for you. Is Christ divided? Was Christ crucified for you? Was Paul crucified for you? Right, because that's something Jesus Christ was did. And look at this. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Right, because why? Because the practice was that they're baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's why it's in this sentence. It's, it, you know, I think that's pretty obvious. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Why? Because Jesus was crucified for you. You're baptized in the name of Jesus, and Jesus is not divided. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. So you see that there is a name by which they are getting baptized, you know, and it's not Paul, right? But what is Paul comparing himself to? Jesus. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. So that's a passage in 1 Corinthians 1 that I think strongly supports this view that the disciples practiced what they said when they baptized is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have four examples in Acts 
where it is explicitly stated by Peter, as well as narrated by Luke under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, where the description of what they're doing is baptizing people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's always really funny when people say, oh, you're baptizing people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, describing what we're doing, saying that that's not scriptural, when in Acts, I mean, that's what the Holy Ghost said. I mean, the Holy Ghost <laughs> described it as that. So how does it make somebody a heretic if they describe it like that too? That uh, just boggles my mind. Now, now when they heard this, look at this in uh, Acts 2.37. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So he's not saying there, I mentioned this yesterday, that we're not baptized in order to remit our sins, we are baptized because of the remission of our sins. So think of the word for, it can mean in order to, or it can mean because of. Like if you think of the sign, I, I'm wanted for murder. It's not that you're looking for somebody to commit a murder. They're wanted because they did commit murder. So it's like here, we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins because we have had our sins remitted when we believed on him. Here's another passage uh, in Acts 8, 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ. So again, what is the emphasis when they're going out and preaching? They're always talking about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're doing things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that name that they're getting persecuted for. They were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So a lot of uh, Pentecostals believe that baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus is when you know, they're baptized, baptized by the Holy Ghost, and then water baptism is something separate. But you know, this passage kind of blows that out of the water because these guys were already baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But it says here, that the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen upon any of them. So it couldn't be that baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus is baptism of the Holy Ghost because these guys were baptized by water in the name of the Lord Jesus, but they weren't yet baptized by the Holy Ghost. That occurred later for these people in Acts 8. Acts 10, this is Peter preaching to that uh, crowd of people that visited him, these Gentiles. And look at what it says here, starting at verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whose name? The name of Jesus Christ, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. And you might say, well, that doesn't say the Lord Jesus. But, you know, I guess you could say, you could say, oh, okay, well, we can take Acts 10 out. But I think it's pretty clear that all throughout Acts, they're emphasizing the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, Acts 19 is the last one. I'll just uh, touch on here in Acts. And it came to pass that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And as they said unto him, uh, and, and, and they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said uh, Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So I'll just stop there because remember, we don't know what John the Baptist was saying when he was baptizing people, right? We don't know exactly the words he said. It's not important exactly the words that he said. But what we do know is that when he was baptizing with the baptism of repentance, he was saying to people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. So he was pointing people to a name, right? To a person when he baptized with the baptism of repentance and it was pointing to Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them and the Holy Ghost came on them uh, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, like I said, you know, we've already sort of covered all the things we do in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Um, we looked at a passage in 1 Corinthians 1 uh, where Paul alludes to that practice. We look at the plain and explicit descriptions, even Peter on the day of Pentecost preaching when he's telling everyone, hey, you know, you need to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, one thing I find funny about, uh, about Peter is that the people at the day of Pentecost, they weren't there when Jesus said to them, go ye therefore baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So if it's so clear that Jesus said to them, hey, this is what you ought to be baptizing in, why then would Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, on the day of Pentecost, mention something to people that they should be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't even know what Jesus had said, right? So it's just, you know, th there's some things that we need to think about. And I'm going to go over, I've got, uh, th I've kind of got four objections to go over, four objections, and they're, and they're not long. Um, but four objections that I've heard, uh, that people have said to me, and I, and I don't think it's an adequate explanation of what I've shown you so far, right? So why do people baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost? It's because of Matthew 28, verse 19. And I want to emphasize it's only because of this, right? There is, there is no, there's no other place you go to, right? There's no other passage in the Bible, you know, why, why are you baptize in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost? When I first started this church, and I just com continued to practice because I hadn't really thought it through until this whole controversy happened, right? And I, I knew I, it never really sat well with me that Acts said in the name of the Lord Jesus, but one of these objections I used to use, just sort of brush it off, you know, it's, so it's kind of the same thing. But this is it, right? There's no other passages. It's, it's Matthew 28 or nothing, right? If you took Matthew 28 out of the equation, the people that baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that's what they say. They've got nothing, yep. right? There's nothing left. This is, this is it. This is the passage, right? Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So, considering Jesus said this to them just before he rose up from the dead, it begs the question, well, if there's so much emphasis on the name of Jesus, Paul alludes to it, in Acts it's repeated again and again and again, you've got to come up with an answer for why it's different, right? Like, why, is, why did Peter say something different? Why is it described different? Why is Paul alluding to baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Somehow it's got to fit with this passage, right? Like I, I can't just take this passage and just run with it and say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what the rest of the Bible says. This is, this is clear. No, no, because I have to take all of Scripture into account. I have to align this verse with everything else I see and make it reasonable. Now, one, one, uh, one explanation might be, they might say, well, the Trinity is only getting a partial mention. And I've sort of mentioned these objectives because I think they're valid object, uh, objections. I think they're valid objections, but I don't think they're adequate to explain away the many things that we read throughout the Bible. So the first, uh, first one I want to talk about, and I'm just sort of getting us all on the same page. You know, I'm not having to go at you if you use this objection. The first one is the Trinity is only getting a partial mention. So the, the, ex, the explanation goes like this. It's like with the sign on top of Jesus when he was crucified. If you read in the different Gospels, you'll get a different uh, thing of what it says on that sign. But the, the answer is they say, well, each Gospel is only giving you a partial reading of what was actually on the sign. And you have to combine all the Gospels together to, to get the whole sign, right? To get all, what the whole sign says. And then we know it was written in different languages and says, here, this is Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews and whatnot. So that's sort of the, the explanation there. Now, the reason why I don't think that's adequate to say that what is being mentioned in Acts is just a partial version of what was actually said is because the people that baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, they don't say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, right? So it would make sense if they said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. Then you can say it's a partial mention, right? Because they're just mentioning the middle section but Matthew 28 gives us the whole thing, which actually has Father and uh, Holy Ghost on either side. So they're not, it's not being described. Peter didn't say, be baptized in the name of the Son, right? Repent and be baptized in the name of the Son. No, he said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But people that practice Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that's what they say when they baptize. They don't say, Father, Jesus, Holy Ghost. They say, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So that would not support their view. That wouldn't be... 
I believe, an adequate explanation. Another objection would be, well, Jesus is the name of the Son. Right? They'll say, well, Jesus is the name of the Son, therefore, you know, it can say, baptized in the name of Jesus, even though, you know, even though it, Matthew 28 says, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Well, I agree with you that Jesus is the name of the Son, but Son is not the name of Jesus, right? So again, it's like, well, if Jesus is the name of the Son, therefore it's described as baptizing in the name of Jesus, then the question is, well, what is the name of the Father and of the Holy Ghost, right? Because if, if, Je if Peter's saying, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and that's the name of the Son, so then what's the name of the Father? What's, what's the name of, of the Holy Ghost, right? And, you know, why name singular? Because now if you say, well, Jesus is the name of the Son, now you're making the point that it has to be a certain name, right? So if it's about the name of the Son, you've got to ask the question, what's the name of the Father? What's the name of the Holy Ghost? And then you've got to ask the question, well, why in Matthew 28 does it say in the name singular of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? Yeah if it's going to be about particular names, which I don't think it is about, right? I don't think it's about a particular name, why it's saying in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, it's talking about the authority of somebody, which uh, I wouldn't say it's not, not about, because it's like, because the name has that authority, right? So, you know, they're trying to separate it from, oh, there's names and there's authority, but to me, it's like, well, that name has the authority and therefore baptizing in the name of somebody is the name that you would mention, right? Because that's the authority by which you baptize. So that's, that's two objections, right? So one is it's just a partial mention. Another is that, you know, well, Jesus is the name of the Son. Well, then the question is, well, what's the name of the Father? What's the name of the Holy Ghost? Why is it only name singular, right? Why isn't it baptizing them in the names of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? And then we use their names instead of their titles, um, I, don't, I don't think that uh, that's, that's an adequate explanation. The last one is, well, the objection goes like this. Well, they're baptizing by Jesus' authority, right? So it's, the, so it's describing, it's baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus, but it's not the particular name as such. It's saying that Jesus gave them that authority in order to baptize, and that's what's being described in Acts. But... The baptism that is by the authority of Jesus is baptism saying Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Now, to me, this is the strongest objection, right? Of the other three, or the, I've got one more. I think this one's the strongest, but what you have to realize about this objection is that it works both ways, right? This is not an objection that is only for the Father, Son, Holy Ghost camp, right? In, the terms, in terms of the phrase, in the name of, meaning by the authority of, right? Because if somebody says, well, we're being baptized by the authority of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that's what we're reading in Matthew 28, and then whose authority do we have to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost? It's Jesus, and therefore it's described in Acts as uh, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. The reason why it works both ways is because whilst you use that explanation to explain Acts, that same reasoning can be done to explain Matthew 28, right? I could say, well, if you say baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's by his authority, so it's the authority of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Jesus has all that authority in Matthew 28, and that's what we're doing when we say baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are baptizing by the authority of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Now, the counter to that, they would say, Okay, well, let's say that now, now the objection is they're equivalent, right? So, so being, whether you're baptized, like we saw in that confession of faith, whether we're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or whether we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, they're equivalent, right? In the sense that you're, it's either authority by two, but Jesus has all that authority. So um, the counter argument to that is, well, if we have in Acts, right, describing baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus, but Jesus saying, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, then they say, well, if there's two, then we're going to go with Jesus, right? That's, that's sort of the, the argument there. So they're saying, well, we have what Peter said, we have what Luke wrote, but we have what Jesus is quoted as saying, which is, you know, just kind of on that, on that note is, well, it's what Matthew wrote, right? So, but then we'll say, well, he's, he's, he's writing a quote of Jesus. They'll say, like, well, I'm going to go with what Jesus actually said as opposed to what peter said or what uh, luke wrote um or whatnot which i think 
all, like I said, already it's, well, Luke wrote Acts, yeah, uh, but Matthew wrote Matthew. So you could say, well, you're going with what Matthew wrote, or you're going with what Jesus wrote. And then you've got the question of, well, um, you've, got the, you've got the, first of all, the straw man, which is, well, is Jesus only what is red letter text in the Bible? Because people will say, well, we'll go with what Jesus said, but we won't go with what Acts said. We won't go with what Peter said. But I, I thought the whole Bible was the word of God. Yeah. Right? I thought the whole Bible was the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. So does it matter whether it's red letter? Does it matter whether the man actually said it when he was on this earth? Does that make it any less legit of the word of God just because it was spoken through the Holy Ghost by David or spoken through the Holy Ghost by Peter or penned down by inspiration by Luke in Acts? I mean, it's all the word of God. You can't say one is the word of Jesus and one is not the word of Jesus unless you say, right? Unless you say that one is somebody's example and one is a statement, right? So I'm kind of going through this reasoning. I hope you're following along with me, right? I'm going through this reasoning. So they'll say, so what they'll say is, yeah, but in the Bible, you have stories and you have statements. And you've heard me preach, you preach that as well, right? You have stories in the Bible, you have examples in the Bible, and you have statements. And you always take the statement above the story. So this, I'm trying to get you to imagine the back and forth here, right? But see, when we talk about the stories and statements, I, I totally understand that principle, right? But when we talk about the stories and the statements, the reason why you take the story, uh, sorry, the reason why you take the statement over the story is because you're implying that the story is wrong, right? The story is the wrong example. The story is the wrong preaching, right? The wrong teaching. So when we think about the case of multiple wives, we say, well, the statement says one man, one wife, but the story shows multiple wives. So when you say, I'm going to take the statement over the story, you, what you are believing then is that the story is the wrong practice the wrong statement, the, the wrong example, right? Now, what you would then have to think is, and this is why they, they don't really want to say this, but some people do, they think that when Peter got up on the day of Pentecost, he was in error. He was doing something wrong. Now, that's what's hard for me to swallow. It's hard for me to swallow that the disciples, they just, a couple of weeks ago, right, saw Jesus ascend up to heaven, saying, Go ye therefore, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So they were there. They were witnesses. They all heard it, right? Then they go into the upper room and he's saying, wait for the promise of the Father, right? They're praying, waiting for this promise. The Holy Ghost fills the room, fills them all with the Holy Ghost. Tongues of fire come down. That's what gives them the boldness to go out and preach on the day of Pentecost. And we know that they're preaching through the power of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because they were preaching in tongues, all sorts of things, right? And then you expect me to believe, I, mean, I just don't know how they expect me to accept this, that then Peter gets up preaching to a bunch of Jews and then he says the wrong thing. Yeah. He gives them the wrong instruction. Yeah. He tells them that they should be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Like, Peter, didn't you know? It's meant to be Father, Son, Holy Ghost, not Jesus. That's what's hard. It's really hard for me to swallow that. Um, so I get the whole idea, statement over the story. But unless I'm willing to accept that the story is wrong, then that means they have to be equivalent somehow. That what we see in Acts has to be equivalent with what Jesus stated here in Matthew 28. And I think we have no problem doing that, Amen. right? Because it's in the name of, he has all the authority, no problem with, uh, with Matthew 28. So we're not, this is the straw man, we're not denying what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Because that's how, that's how it's always been positioned. It's like, we're going with what Jesus said, you're not going with what Jesus said. No, 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 I'm going with what Jesus said here, right? It's just that I understand it differently, right? Because I'm equating it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to harmonize the scriptures together to see why was it practiced differently? Why did Paul say this? Why is everything done in the name of Jesus? But yet Matthew 28 seems to say something different. So was Peter incorrect? Was the Holy Ghost incorrect when it inspired Luke to describe the practice as baptized in the name of Jesus? If it's, if it's not incorrect... Right? If we're not saying, well, we take the statement over the story and the story's not incorrect, then shouldn't we go with the practice? Right? I mean, that, like if we're wondering how to interpret scriptures and how, how to do what we do in church, don't we look to Acts and go, well, how did the disciples do it? Yeah. 
right? How did they break bread? Like, how did they do? Like, this is, a, this is what we always think about when we think, how did we do it in church? I always think, I wish I could sit in one of the early church meetings of the apostles, because then I could just know what they did and just copy it, right? But we get a glimpse into Acts to see what they did, and we're trying through the epistles, through Acts, to emulate what they did, unless we believe and can show from the scripture that what they did was wrong. But, but, you know, it's hard for me to swallow that what Peter said on the day of Pentecost was wrong, what Paul said was wrong, what, what Acts describes is wrong. That's a really hard pill for me to swallow. Now, let me show you in Acts 4, where power and name are synonymous, right? If something's done by somebody's power or somebody's done by somebody's name, it's the same thing. So this is where the disciples in Acts 4, uh, verse 7, they asked him their question and they said when they set them in the midst, they asked by what power or by what name have you done this thing, right? Because when you do something in the name of somebody, you're doing it by the authority that that name carries. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. And I won't read the rest for sake of time, but basically we see here the synony- the, how it's synonymous, that whether you do something by somebody's power or you do something by their name, you're doing it by their authority. It's just another way to say by their authority. And that's how we interpret Matthew 28. Right? When you look at Matthew 28, and you don't just focus on verse 19, you look at verse 18 as well. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me. Remember, power is the same as name. So why are they baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus has all power given unto him in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, therefore, why? because he has all power, he has all authority in heaven and in earth. He goes, therefore, go and baptize them, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So is Jesus saying here what we should say when we baptize? No, no, it's not about exactly what is said. It's saying, you know, we're baptizing by what Matthew 28 teaches us is that Jesus has the authority of the Godhead. He has the authority of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That's why when they baptized, in Jesus' name, they had, that name has the authority of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Because why? All power is given unto him. Now, the last objection I just want to cover is this idea, well, people are saying, you know, because the, 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 they're resisting, right? Uh, like, they, they, like, people just resist, like, you know, all the scriptures that are there, and they just, they're just thinking, like, but this is just so clear. Right? Like, I, I don't know, like, I, I must, uh, you know, understand the other passages in light of this passage because it's just so clear. I mean, it came out of Jesus' mouth, just, just clear as day, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and if I baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, it's just blatantly going against what this is saying. That's their view, right? Because like I said, you know, our, my position has no problem with this passage. My position fits perfectly with this passage because Jesus has all authority, Right? But let's say somebody says, you know, this is just so clear. No, there's no way around this, right? Like, that's what Jesus said. Well, what I want to show you is if we just compare this passage of the Great Commission with the Great Commission in Luke and in Mark, right? So we just compare the other Great Commissions. Look at what it says here in Mark 16. So this is the Great Commission in Mark 16. He says, I said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, what if somebody said to you, man, like, you know, the Pentecostal comes to you. This is just so clear. This came out of Jesus' mouth that you must must believe, you must be baptized, and you're saved. What would you you say to them? You'd say, well, yeah, I get that that statement is clear, but what does it mean, right? And then we start to think, well, I have to look at the rest of the passage. You know, know, is is it even talking about water baptism? You know, I believe it's talking about baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know, we, we go on to the next phrase. It says, well, he that believeth not shall be damned. So what we make the case and say, well, it's not baptism that condemns you because it's only belief that saves you. And yeah, even if you are baptized, you will be saved, 
right? We think of, you know, because what are we doing, right? We're trying to harmonize what we understand about all the scripture and harmonize this with it, right? That's what we do. And that's what we do with this passage. But if somebody just said, oh, it's just clear, you know, you must be baptized with water to be saved, you know, came out of Jesus' mouth, you would think, hey, you're not really harmonizing it with the rest of scripture. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Look at this. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So isn't it interesting here in, in this passage, what's the emphasis, right? It's Jesus' name that's, that, 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 is, that is the emphasis, right? So there's no mention of Father, Son, Holy Ghost here, but he's saying, hey, in my name, you're going to do these things. And that's why I'm talk I believe that baptism in this passage is talking about baptism of the Holy Ghost because it talks about these signs that will follow um, and they end up, uh, you know, it says later on, confirming the word with signs following, amen. Now let's look at Luke 24. Again here, it says, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, Jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things. So they're going to go out and preach repentance and remission of sins what? In the name of Jesus Christ. So again, in Luke 24, when he's talking about sending them out, again, the emphasis is it's the name of Jesus. In Mark, the emphasis is the name of Jesus, right? So then why would Matthew 28, wouldn't that line up with these other comparisons that where Jesus is the focal point of that passage? And he is. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and baptize by the authority of the three persons within the Godhead. Now, this lines up very closely. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name with Acts 2.38, right? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So again, the name of Jesus is associated with repentance and remission of sins, which is what baptism is, right? Baptism, you're getting baptized for the remission of sins, right? So wouldn't it make sense that if we're describing what we're doing we are glorifying and giving honor to the name of Jesus Christ. So I'm coming to an end here, just a couple of thoughts. So the Bible says here in 2 Thessalonians 1, Wherefore also we, we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of, his, of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that ought to be the aim of everything we do. The reason why we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason why we identify as Christians is because we are trying to give glory to that name by which we do all things. And baptism is no different. This is why the apostles did it. It's about giving glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, like I said, it's about what is the best thing to say. It's not about, you know, your position on the Trinity, right? You can believe in baptism in the, name of the of, in the name of Jesus Christ, even if you believe in the Trinity, even if you believe in the Catholic Trinity. It's not about validating or invalidating a baptism. What it's about is when we baptize somebody and we're going to give glory and honor to a name and we're going to tell people by what authority we are doing this act, whose name should it be? Should it be by the authority of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or should it be by the name of Jesus? I hope that as you look through these passages, it's overwhelmingly in support of, the, of, of pronouncement by the name of the Lord Jesus, um, because like I said, it explains perfectly Matthew 28. Now, somebody might say, well, you know, but, but this does, just doesn't sit right with me, you know, because it's kind of like, you know, I've, I've always baptized in, in, you know, I've always known baptism in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and it just doesn't sit right with me. But you know what you really should be thinking about is, you know, when you, when you look through, the, when you read through the Bible and you see it again and again and again, what shouldn't sit right with you is why are people baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost when there's so many mentions of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus? That's what doesn't sit right with me. That's why I never really thought about this. Right? Like I just, I just did what I was taught, what I carried on. I knew Matthew 28 saying, hey, that's why I do it this way. But when you start looking at all the other passages, unless you have a better explanation for why the rest of the New Testament is saying, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that's what shouldn't sit right with you. Like that, that's what doesn't sit right with me, is why would they continue to do that when that's not the practice we see in Acts? And again, what's the support? We have God commanding us that all things should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have Peter speaking it under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. We have Luke describing it under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in Acts. We have Paul alluding to baptism in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We even have that confession of faith that I showed you. And I'm saying like, that's kind of a minor point, but it's out there, right? That people recognize that there is a preference either way. The question is, what is the better preference? Right? What's the better thing to do? What is, should be our aim when we baptize? It's to give glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does the Father, Son, Holy Ghost crowd have? Matthew 28, yep. 19. That's it. Yep. That's, that's all there is. And it's not even an objection to the other position because the position of baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ fits Matthew 28 perfectly. But that's all they have. But it's difficult, like I said, to harmonize consistently with all other scriptures. You know, like the, 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 you know, at least when I think about the fact that there's only one passage to support that view, I just think, you know, even, even people that believe in work salvation have more than people that baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Because you think about it, like I said, if you take away Matthew 28, 19, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you've got nothing, yep. right? But at least somebody that believes in work salvation, right? Like people that say, oh, you know, James 2, faith without works is dead. We've all had those conversations, right? Where it's just like, faith without works is dead. Faith, you know, and they're just like, God. But at least somebody that believes in works salvation, they can go, they try and go to parables, right? The parable of the pounds and the talents. They go to like the rich young ruler, right? They go to other obscure passages where it's kind of like, that kind of sounds like works salvation. I mean, that's a, that's a, bit, of a, it's a bit of a tougher sell to that person, right? But the people that believe Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Matthew 28, 19, that's all there is. So if that's not the reason, maybe, maybe the reason, you know, is it, is it just tradition that they hold on to it? You know, we don't use tradition. Uh, you know, is it fear? Some people will shy away. I'm not saying any of you guys, but some people might shy away from believing this, you know, because I've, I've seen comments from people online and from other churches saying, yeah, well, you know, you, you, you make a good point, but I just wonder, are they fearful to actually do it why? Because they're going to get labelled by a man in Phoenix, Arizona as a oneness Pentecostal yeah. heretic, right? So maybe that, I just hope that's not one of the reasons. They just don't have the guts to believe what the Bible says. But, you know, I just square with you guys. I just, I just don't, like, see, when I look at these passages, I don't know how to continue baptising in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's just like, you know, it's, it just gets to the point where it's like, do I believe the Bible or not? Like, if I... You know, if, if I have no reason to, um, you know, continue to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, there's only one passage that does it. It's, it's perfectly explained by the rest. You know, I don't know how I can continue to do that when it's, it seems so glaringly obvious to me. But, you know, that, that's my case. That, I, think, I don't think there's an adequate explanation. I honestly just think the reason why people are baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost is because they're just going with Matthew 28, 19. You know, maybe they've got it from the Catholics, I don't know. But, you know, I think to, to, to discount what we see in Acts and all the other reasons, uh, you know, I just, I just don't know how we can continue to, to just uh, hold on to that view. Anyways, I hope you learned something. I know uh, maybe some of you uh, don't really know the controversy that's going on. But I just wanted to get us all on the same page in terms of the explanations, what my view is at least, so you understand why I do what I do, and, and then you guys are free to talk about it as well. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Um, thank you uh, for your word. Um, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you um, that through his name we can be saved and uh, we have a home in heaven. We just uh, pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless the rest of our time here. I pray, Lord, that... Uh, you know, there's just so many fights and strife that happens within independent Baptist circles. So I just pray, Lord, that you would preserve us from that, help us to, to speak with love, and uh, Lord, help us to just seek uh, what is the truth. And uh, Lord, um, I just pray that you would help us all to do that. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.